The next speaker is uh, my brother to another mother, uh, Dr. Bradley Leach. We'll be talking about the health seeking behaviour and well-being of Australian adults with uh, suspected increased intestinal permeability, a cross-sectional study. So welcome to the stage, Dr. Leach. I'm not a doctor yet, but thank you, Dr. Leach. <laughs> Give me another couple of months. All right, let's talk all about intestinal permeability. But before we do, I want to ask you two questions to critically reflect on during this presentation. Considering the fact that no research to date has investigated the burden of disease in intestinal permeability, do you think Australian adults with intestinal permeability experience disease burden? If so, what? The second question I want you to consider is how can practitioners better support their patients with intestinal permeability? To answer these questions, and let's say many others, we conducted a cross-sectional survey of 589 Australian adults with suspected intestinal permeability. We explored three main areas of potential disease burden using validated methods. They were financial, subjective well-being, and health-related quality of life. As expected, the vast majority of the surveyed population were female which actually reflects what we see in clinical practice. Now, almost half of the population reported a healthy BMI. But the thing to note is more than half were either overweight or obese, which comes as no surprise as we know uh, obesity is a known risk factor for intestinal permeability. The other thing I want you to consider here is almost 50% of the population expressed that they found it easy or not too bad to live on their available income. But first, let's talk about the assessment of intestinal permeability. Uh, delay in disease diagnosis is seen across many health conditions here in Australia, but what about intestinal permeability? For the first time in the published literature, we're able to estimate the time between first suspecting intestinal permeability and receiving a formal diagnosis. Would anyone like to take a guess at how long? I hear two years in the back, <laughs> five years down the front. You'll be surprised. Eleven years. That's how long I've been at university. It's a long time. <laughs> so why is there such delay in the diagnosis of intestinal permeability? I suspect that we, as a profession, are to blame. You see, practitioners like you and I will frequently use clinical history and case questions to determine whether or not our patients have intestinal permeability. But it's not actually what our patients want. You see, 90% of our surveyed population actually said they want to be assessed for intestinal permeability. Better yet, 64% said they want to be test, um, assessed by you. They want to be assessed by a naturopath, with others saying either a nutritionist or a integrative GP. Diving a little deeper, we found that patients actually want to be assessed before receiving treatment. So here's the question on everybody's mind right now. Why should I test if I suspect, why not just treat? 93% of individuals said if they were measured for intestinal permeability and positive, they are very likely to adhere to a treatment protocol. Adherence to a treatment protocol? Can it get any better than that? That's what we're looking for. So let's dive a little deeper into the burden of disease for individuals with intestinal permeability, starting with the financial cost. Now hold on to your seats. <laughs> on average, patients would spend uh, $700 a year on the consultation fees associated with intestinal permeability. 
over $2,000 on dietary supplements and close to $300 for the assessment of intestinal permeability. Believe it or not, these results weren't actually the results that surprised us the most. Upon further analysis, we looked at how much these individuals spent on dietary supplements and consultation fees uh, in relation to how well they can manage their available income. And what we actually found was as the amount of uh, money spent on consultation fees and dietary supplements increased, how well these patients managed their available income actually decreased. So those who found it difficult all of the time actually spent significantly more than those who found it easy to manage on their available income. We're unable to suggest or, or make any comments as to why this is the case, but what we can take away from this is the potential financial burden, especially for those who struggle financially. We utilise the Personal Wellbeing Index as a marker of subjective wellbeing as it's been validated in the Australian population. Now, on the left-hand side, you've got the mean results of the Australian population, and on the right-hand side, the mean of our surveyed population. And the uh, Personal Wellbeing Index can be viewed as a scale, 0 to 100, with a lower result indicating a worse subjective wellbeing. What we found was a statistically significant difference in total subjective well-being and all domains compared to our surveyed population and the Australian population. Individuals with suspected intestinal permeability have worse subjective well-being than the Australian population. We took this analysis one step further and considered their self-reported outcome of intestinal permeability. What we found was participants who described an exacerbation of their intestinal permeability in the previous 12 months actually had a worse subjective well-being than those who reported an improvement. To further strengthen the relationship between disease burden and intestinal permeability, we undertook a multiple regression analysis. Now, the researchers in the room will go, mm-hmm. Uh, the naturopaths will go, uh-huh. Um, basically, what this shows is that a self-reported improvement of intestinal permeability is a predictor for both subjective well-being and health-related quality of life. That's amazing. So for the first time, we're able to suggest in the literature that there is a potential disease burden for Australian adults with suspected intestinal permeability, with a uh, lower subjective well-being and a lower health-related quality of life and an increased financial cost. So we've spoken about disease burden. Now, a lot of people would say, well, what should we do about it? The more important question is, what do our patients want us to do about it? I asked them. 90, does say? 82% said they, they want us to use dietary treatment strategies as the first line therapy for the management of intestinal permeability. Closely followed by dietary supplements, such as vitamins, minerals, and herbs. Now, surprise, surprise, <laughs> medications, they don't want to be prescribed medications. Now, what's quite important and interesting here is that regardless of their reported financial well-being and their financial um, ability to manage their finances on a day-to-day -day basis, they want to allocate their finances to dietary treatments. And the last thing I'll mention here is that we asked them from, from 30 different options. We said, okay, what's the most important area that you want your practitioners to have knowledge in? They said dietary treatments. So if you're going to take a photo of one slide and share one slide, let this be the slide. Based on our results, we identified a number of therapies and lifestyle factors which were associated with the self-reported improvement or exacerbation of intestinal permeability. Now, a lot of what's on the slide is supported by pre-existing research, or you, as naturopaths, 
uh, are actually utilizing at the moment, such as um, the avoidance of gluten, um, antibiotics, NSAIDs, while incorporating things such as zinc, glutamine, and bone broth. The one thing that I found particularly interesting is that those patients who work alongside a healthcare practitioner reported a statistically significant improvement in their intestinal permeability compared to those who don't. The question on everybody's mind right now is what are we going to do with this information? Sit back, relax, don't worry, I have you covered. You see, by the end of the year, you'll have access to the IP guideline, an evidence-based clinical practice guideline for the assessment and management of intestinal permeability. Better yet, these, this IP guideline and the developed recommendations will utilise the views and preferences of Australian adults with suspected intestinal permeability, ensuring that our profession better supports our patients. That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you.